The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters Radio Show was originally broadcast on November 30th, 2021. Welcome, Maui, to the Business Matters Radio Show, sponsored by Mokulele Airlines and brought to you by the Maui Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, Pamela Tumba, president of the Maui Chamber, and today we're going to talk with Representative Wildberger on how the state and county can partner on affordable housing and rentals, the need to revisit the certificate of need process that deals with medical facilities and hospitals, uh, and look at possible new industries to further our economic development. We're also going to look at Neighbor Island Healthcare, the West Maui Community Plan, and the West Maui Taxpayers' Association, and speak with a local business owner who, whose motto is, the journey is the reward. And so they are thankful and grateful for every step along the way. But we're going to begin right now with Representative Tina Wilberger. She is a Kihei resident for 23 years and also has 23 years of work experience in Hawaii in both the hospitality profession in food and beverage and as a small business owner in manufacturing and distribution. She understands the issues faced by business owners working hard to make ends meet in an island economy. And Tina currently represents House District 11 and is a member of the Government Reform, Finance, and Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Committees. Aloha, Tina, and good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Pam. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you this morning. It's my great pleasure. Uh, there is so much going on, and, and those two committees are certainly very very pertinent to the things that we're going to talk about this morning, and it's great to have your service on those very important committees. Um, let's talk a little bit about affordable housing. And, you know, one of the things we hear it all the time at the county level, um, as well as at the state level, with how far not just Maui County is, but everybody is in behind in affordable uh, housing and rental units. And it's a big uh, priority for the chamber as well. And we're looking at how can the state and county partner together on creating more affordable housing and rental units? And how can we expedite some of these processes? So I think you hit the nail on the head, and it doesn't matter what uh, what area or what topic you're talking about. The state and the county operate in, in no matter which county you're talking about, be it Honolulu, Big Island, Maui, or Kauai, everybody's operating in a silo, and they're duplicating efforts. So I think if we were to coordinate efforts, combine resources, what the state brings to the table mostly is land, right? Right. And so uh, the counties need to handle the the planning and permitting part, but the state can come to the table and bring land where we need to do development. Yes. And then there is, you know, there are some areas where the state is in charge of permitting, um, you know, as we're looking at uh, some of the environmental issues um, and some of the shoreline issues and things. How do you feel we can work between county and state to expedite some of the permitting processes? Right, because the state handles the more broad, broader land use. Um, we are going to have to tackle the issue of sea level rise and inundation and yes. development that already exists at the shoreline, and we do not have solutions for that. I've been pushing for the DLNR to come up with comprehensive statewide policy regarding managed retreat or and uh, trying not to harden the shoreline. But um, I think we, we really need to make the commitment that um, while developers want to do luxury development because that maximizes their profit, we have to stick to our community plans that already exist and develop the, the housing that we need, which is affordable housing for our workforce. Yeah, it is. It really is so important. And and um, how much land are, are you seeing that the state has access to? I know. Well, there's a couple of things that as we work with developers that keep coming up that they talk about level of affordability, and and a lot of it also is infrastructure. 
and land. I mean, so, you know, if there's parcels that the county and state own, um, that helps bring down the cost if we can start Pre- developing precisely. those. If you, if you don't have um, water transmission, if you don't have wastewater, and, and now, we, you know, we can no longer develop parcels and say, well, we're, we're just going to put cesspools in or we're just going to put in, you know, uh, we need better wastewater management. So we have to take environmental considerations uh, keep those in mind and make sure that we're developing. So we do have to partner with the state and, and lever- leveraging. We have the opportunity to leverage uh, infrastructure dollars. We have billions of dollars coming into the state, and uh, infrastructure for development is a great place to allocate those resources. And are you, I know one of the things that with um, especially the new money coming out of Washington with the the major infrastructure bill, um, I you know it, there's been some uh, discussions back and forth, and we don't really have the answer yet. But it's, it keeps sounding like people are waiting to hear how that gets funneled through, where the overarching uh, sort of spending decisions lie. Do you have any information on how that's going to kind of come down or come through from the state to the county levels? So um, I understand from um, a conference call I did with the NCSL folks that the states can decide whether or not they want to kind of put their fingers in, 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 the, in the mechanism and, and decide where the money is going to go and have decision-making power over that, or if they just want it to go ahead and go um, to the different agencies that will distribute um, there's also going to be competitive money, um, I think $12, mil- $12 billion going to be allocated that um, individual um, municipalities like the county of Maui can compete for. So I want to be sure to get those resources um, to our council members so that they know uh, about those opportunities. I think that's one, one, one place where both county and state governments are, are not um, – super skilled at getting as much federal money that's available. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, in in economic development and even in the nonprofit world, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where um, in the old days we had more grant writers. There's still some really excellent grant writers in our county, and they're doing an amazing job. And so a lot of people, though, you know, aren't well trained in how to go after these big grants. And, and when you're talking about federal money, it's, there's a lot of nuances to get that. So we really need some skilled people helping those with great ideas to move forward and make sure that we're capturing our fair share of, of those kinds of dollars. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, it, I think that infrastructure would be a great place. Again, the, the two things seem to come down to, like, as you mentioned, uh, land is the huge issue. And then the next big issue is, well, how do we get the infrastructure there that allows for some of these other things as, you know. And that's, that's the big holdup for DHHL, right? Mm-hmm. They've, got, they've got land, but they, they don't get the funding to put in the roads, to put in the wastewater, to put in the electrical to put in the uh, Wi-Fi. And so, you know, that's where, that's where we need to be making these investments. So I'm, I'm thrilled to see this money coming to the state, and um, I'm confident that we'll be able to maximize its benefits. I, I think that's awesome, and we hope so too. And we're here to help. So <laughs> let, let us know how we can help spread the word, or uh, as opportunities come up, you know how we can get people involved. Because we do have a great development community who's who's willing and wanting to do more affordable housing and rentals. Um, and we all sort. Of, there's a lot of things, as Mayor shared with us a while back, a lot of things in the pipeline, but we're still not sort of catching up. And so needing to find new ways, new partnerships to move forward so that we can catch up and address both the land and the infrastructure issues, which will go a long way to not passing and heaping all of that on as construction costs are already going up just because the materials are are going up right now. Oh my gosh, lumber went through the roof last year. I think it's come down a little bit, but boy, that was, that was stunning. Yeah. It was it was really staggering, and, and we also know that the longer it takes for us to get through the, the planning and the permitting and getting the housing up, as the projects are delayed or delayed over multiple years, the cost goes up. You know, it, it never goes back down to what, what it yeah, was when it was a, first proposed. As a member of the Government Reform Committee, I am trying to get uh, resources put toward 
um, modernizing all of our state departments so that they're not working in the dark ages with index cards and yeah. records so that, you know, if the permitting process should be completely online. And I kind of like to model um, what San Francisco does because their permitting process is all online. It's all very um, accessible. It's all very viewable. There's nothing, you know, undisclosed, and it really goes a long way toward uh, efficiency and, uh, you know, just better responsive government. I think that's awesome. And, I, you know, we, we keep talking about it, and I know, like, when the de- Department of Labor systems were crashing when we were trying to do the unemployment mm-hmm. insurance, and, and we weren't alone. We, You know, this was across other states as mm-hmm. well. But others got theirs back online quicker. <laughs> And, right. you know, and so this modernization is really important. So I think that that's an excellent use. And, and maybe some of this can be some of that infrastructure money can go to that, too, on the permitting. That would be awesome as well. Right. We have intangible infrastructure, right? Software. Yeah. Software and online systems and things to make mm-hmm. it work. And, and yet we know the technology is working so well these days. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the hospital systems when with COVID, you know, we saw that we were really carefully and needing to carefully look at our hospital capacity and, you know, how things worked and, and how many beds were taken up and how many were in ICU and how many were on ventilators and those sort of things. And in the past, in, in your district area, you know, we looked at having another hospital out in Kihei. Yeah, I remember. Uh, And the certificate of need process really was a big obstacle to doing that. I've talked to several legislators now to say, is this time for us to revisit the certificate of need process and go back and take a look um, at our hospital capacity and whether we need to be expanding and reopening up? And I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. So it seems perhaps that it's an antiquated idea, right? Um, If the state owns all of the hospitals, it doesn't want to pay for competitive issues, right? Right. But, you know, Maui's single and only hospital is now privatized, even though it still gets tens of million dollars a year from the state. It's a for-profit facility that runs at, at capacity as much as possible, even prior pandemic. Right. And so this is just kind of an ugly little secret that has been revealed with the pandemic. But the hospital wants to be, um, wants to make money. That's that's their agenda. Um, I feel that their mission is not patient or uh, staff focused. And if we had a competition for the hospital, they may have to operate in a different manner. Um, the issues is not not so significant in Kihei, but the poor people that live on the west side, they've got a 45 minute minimal commute to get hospital care, which is you know, truly life and death. And I think if um, our medical system, the insurance industry, were held to antitrust standards like every other industry is, that we would have, you know, we could flip the script and instead of having um, a medical care desert that Maui County is, instead maybe we could have state-of-the-art medical tourism and bring the best care available in our nation to our islands because people want to come here for treatment. You know, a- absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And we're, I, I want to follow up on that in a minute as well, because to get to medical tourism, that is one of going to be one of the obstacles with the certificate of need process. And it's a, it's a long and sort of arduous process uh, that many other states have already abolished. It was some, it, there was a period of time where it existed in many states across the nation, but now it's very few. Yeah, maybe it's, um, you know, it sounds like it's time to, to revisit that and figure out wh- what where the benefit is. Um, I, like I said, I could see where the state wouldn't want to um, duplicate costs if they're providing services at the at the expense of the taxpayer. Right. But when you're talking about privatized health care, that's a different story. Right. And that's, that's what... Uh you know, the Kihei Hospital was going to be. It was private funds, and it was, but it, it was at a time when, again, our hospital wasn't, uh, my memorial wasn't privatized, and there was a lot of concerns about would we be able to have, you know, have all the doctors we need, and would we be able to attract all the nurses we need. And, and I think there's still some issues, of course, around that. Um, but again, as you point out, as we look at um, allowing more privatization of hospitals and systems, 
you know, there were a lot of people, and I know Joe Pluto is going to come on a little later in the show, is going to talk about that, where right. we I mean, were headlines. I mean, a hospital in Kihei would be complete luxury, but the West Side needs an ER so badly. They need yes. an emergency room. They need a, a trauma facility so that people that have life and death uh, injuries don't have to spend 45 minutes to get to care. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they really are, you know, it's been a longstanding battle. And with I mean, the poly it, in... <laughs> it seems like a certificate of need could be presented there relatively easily. Yeah. Well, they, they did, you know, they did get, they were able to get through part of that and get through that element, but now we're, they're working on the investment side and trying to figure yeah, out other avenues. And then economic funding issues, right? Yeah, so there was some definitely funding issues, and um, it, you know, so that's kind of has hampered things, but it's, it's really important that, as you say, we get them the services and there's ways to do it. Um, and, and there's, if we go into, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about next, but it will come up if we're really looking to expand in, as you pointed out, medical tourism, which is a great, uh, it, it's a great economic avenue that has literally, at least for me, probably longer, but when I was at the Maui Economic Development Board working there, you know, over 20 years ago, we were talking about medical tourism and how it leveraged also um, off of, you know, one, our position in the Pacific Rim was great for that. Um, we had a, a stellar uh, cancer research center at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and then we looked at all of these pe- people who would leverage off of the visitor industry who would want to come and stay right. in a it's beautiful a perfect, place. It's a perfect marriage with our existing visitor industry infrastructure with the hotel rooms and all of that. It's perfect compliment. Yeah, it, it, it's, it always seemed to be one of those no-brainer type of ideas, but also one of those types of things that, again, as you're establishing different clinics to do different things, the CON process will come into play. So, For sure. what are some of the other things that, you know, again, with COVID, um, we all understand how important the visitor industry is and how many other industries, uh, restaurant, retail activities, weddings and events, and so many other industries were leveraged off of the visitor industry to mm-hmm. provide uh, expanded job opportunities for our residents. But we also realize we're over-dependent on the industry, and you know we need to look at uh, further economic development. What are some of the other areas that you see would be top places to further develop in, and what do you see, you know, economic development is one, a long-term strategy, and two, it requires investment or incentives often, as many people um, across the nation, many states are trying to attract the same types of industry with higher paying wages. What do you see as the state's role in this effort? Well, this, this pandemic has showed us exactly how fragile our tourist economy is and all of the um, domino effect of you know, not being able to welcome visitors in the manner that we're accustomed to. Um, as someone who's environmentally um, uh, interested, I would love to see um, more manufacturing develop to use our waste material. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a beautiful small business example of this in Kahului called Revive Glassworks. I don't know if you've seen their products, but they are taking glass. Um, from Maui's recycling program and creating value-added products, beautiful candles, beautiful glass and stemware, beautiful hydroponic planters, and really just a gorgeous um, line of products, of retail products, that he's, you know, taking trash and turning it into treasure. So this sort of thing, I'd love to see plastics recycling. I'd love to see us using our, um, our metal And I sort of envisioned a bill that I put forward my first year in office, um, put uh, different recycling manufacturing facilities on each island. So, for instance, Maui would do glass, Kauai could do metal, Oahu could do um, cardboard or, you know, this way we wouldn't just be shipping our our stuff back to the mainland and instead making use of it. Um, I remember that Maui had a very wonderful uh, plastic recycling manufacturing facility and I still have fence fence posts in my yard from (laughs) the early 90s that were made with this recycled plastic that was a wonderful material. Yeah and they do and they were doing glass uh, but they were doing sort of crushed glass for landscapes it was Tom Reed 
Um, and I know this story well. In fact, I, I tell it often. There, uh, at the Research and Technology Center, we bought um, recycled plastic, which was park, created into park benches. And those are the most amazing benches ever. But They last forever. And they're going to last they forever. They don't rust. Yep. They don't break. I mean, it's really a, a wonderful product. So I also have a, a sort of a dream that would, that would fit so well into our existing hotel tourism infrastructure. Uh, I kind of dream, and I talked to a gym owner in Maui about this, um, where the Mega Mall parcel is next to the new high school facility to put in a world-class Olympic training facility mm. and encourage world-class athletes to come to Hawaii and train off-season um, and similar to the facility that they have in Colorado. I think that we could attract um, a lot of athletes to come and train. Because, And I got this idea because of COVID where we had athletes who were not able to go to pools coming to swim in the ocean uh-huh. to maintain their, their, their training regimen. I saw um, polo water polo players playing in the ocean at Cam 1 with inflatable nets, huh. and that's where I got that idea. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have a world-class Olympic athlete training facility for all sports? I think that South would Mountain. be amazing. Yeah, I, I really think that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> um, because, again, it, it lends to some of the things that we're looking at, health and wellness. We have amazing athletes here. We have amazing people who even live here part-time but are amazing athletes. Um, we have all of our surfing and community. And the weather. Yep. And yeah. and there are people who, you know, they would they would love to train here. The, the weather is beautiful. I think that's an awesome idea. Well, I'm going to have to have you back on the show. This has gone so quick, but <laughs> we're, we're at that time. But I just want to thank you, Representative Wahlberger, for joining us this morning. We, we truly appreciate you making the time to be with us and, and to share these great ideas. And, thank uh, you so much, Pam. It's, it's our pleasure. We look forward to working with you this legislative session. All right. Stay in touch. We will. Thank you, you too. So much. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, we'll be right back after a brief message from our sponsor, Mokulele Airlines. Mokulele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokulele from Kahului to Molokai, Lanai, Hana, Waimea, Kona, and now Hilo. Mokulele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. There is never a middle seat on Mokulele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokuleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokulele Terminal. And we're back. If you're just tuning in, this is Business Matters, brought to you by the Maui Chamber of Commerce. We're now going to welcome Joe Pluta, who is president of the West Maui Taxpayers Association and the West Maui Improvement Foundation. Joe has 30 years in the real estate and travel industry in Hawaii, and he has been uh, devoted to a myriad of diversified positions from the ground floor up in restaurants, hotels, and condominium hotels. Originally from Chicago, working with his parents in the family business, he came to Hawaii in the submarine service of the U.S. Navy. He worked in various positions in the travel industry while he attended the University of Hawaii and graduated with a BBA in travel industry management and real estate. Joe is a current member of the Realtors Association of Maui, Lahaina Rotary, and volunteers on a number of committees in this community. Joe, good morning and welcome to the show. We're glad to have you back. Well, thank you, Pamela. Good morning. It's a wonderful day in Maui Ne. Oh, it really is. Any rain on the west side? No, it's beautiful. Beautiful day here. Awesome. It was it was a little rainy when I came down, but uh, it opened up after I left Pukalani, so that's awesome. Well, well, let's talk a little bit. We were just talking with uh, Representative Wahlberger about health care, and I know that that's really important to you. Let's talk about some of your concerns with health care access uh, on the neighbor islands and also how government plays a role in this important system when we talk about things like the certificate of need process. Oh, thank you, Pamela. Yes, I've, I've been very concerned about um, health care uh, in Maui. I, uh, when I came to Maui in 1979 to um, live full-time from Honolulu, I had been living in Honolulu the first prior 10 years where access to health care was not even on anybody's uh, concern list. But when I came here to West Maui, I 
I was just shocked at just how uh, it seemed like uh, West Maui was just so um, underserved in uh, mm-hmm. access to health care. We, uh, the West Maui taxpayers uh, together, uh, decided we could do something about that. And uh, I, I could talk a long time about that history, but I'm right. Let's get right to the meat of the matter: is that Hawaii's uh, certificate of need laws, or it's called CON. Um, those in the healthcare industry know it. When you say CON, they know exactly what you're talking about. Certificate of need rules. Uh, it's it's restricting the best possible healthcare for our communities. Uh, a government overreach in this area has never been more evident than what the, now that this pandemic has happened. Uh, it's it, it's it's really scary. But we should learn from something about this, right? Uh, I, it, it's, it's so bad. People don't uh, want to think about this, but government overreach in restricting access to medical care providers has literally uh, indirectly been responsible for the loss of life of thousands of people in Hawaii due to the non-availability of life-saving access to hospital beds and emergency medical needs. And it, that's got to hit somebody right between the eyes when they start thinking about that. That's actually, that's a true statement. Yeah. How, how, and how, how government is supposed to be led by governors and mayors whose jobs and number one priority is the health and safety of the people in all our communities. And regrettably, neighbor island mayors are restricted by state government who simply can't understand our problem because on Oahu, everything there seems to be okay. You know how things are relative to you. It's just out of sight, out of mind, and that's been the neighbor islands problem for the longest time. And uh, Maui's uh, and Maui, it's, it's been West Maui's problem for the longest time. You, yeah. you don't have to go to West Maui for anything, any essential things that you have to do: to go to the airport, to go to the hospital, to to, to go uh, to Costco. <laughs> 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 any, uh, you know, any people they could live all their whole life and get everything they need without ever having to go to West Maui. And unfortunately. Many people never come for that reason, and they were out of their, their immediate thought process because of that. This pandemic has accelerated my concerns about government interference to access to health care, especially here. Uh, yeah, Oahu-centric government has got to wake up about what this pandemic has revealed to us, and they've got, you know, they're responsible for all the state of Hawaii, not just Oahu. <laughs> right. We wrote an article as a West Maui taxpayers that was published by Kristen Downey, written for Civil Beat, and we had permission from them to reprint it on our October newsletter. You can, if people want to see more about this, they can just go to our website at westmaui.org, www.westmaui.org. There in that article, she says, according to the Mercatus Center, a conservative think tank at George Mason University in the Washington, D.C. area suburbs. Hawaii has more regulatory hurdles for new health care facilities than any other state in the nation, with 28 separate services subject to state limitations. This is an exact quote from this study. The number of services where a certificate of need is needed in Hawaii is quite high, and the fees associated with that is quite high as well, said Dr. Matthew D. Mitchell, a senior research fellow at Mercatus who did this the state-to-state comparisons in in their research. Big hospital systems seem to like certificates of need because it protects their bottom line. It doesn't help the community, but it it lets them have a monopoly. Hawaii, uh, the neighbor islands, all have two um, emergency rooms and two two hospitals, except Maui. We have one. And uh, while people have referred to Kula Hospital as being another uh, access that's not that's that's a nursing home that's not a a hospital it's 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 we have one and and the west side has been very 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 uh an area of concern to us well because i can of access and we we were able to uh prove our point about all that yeah and obtain back in 19, 2009 a certificate of need for a developer to build a, to get a west Maui hospital yeah and everybody said that was impossible we got the, we were able to get that, but due to any number of financial difficulties and things beyond anyone's concern, that never got 
built yet, but it's still allegedly underway. Yeah. Uh, report, the last report was that it's going to be scaled back to five critical access beds. And uh, instead of the 25 beds, it was going to be. But we'll take it and um, with an emergency room. And uh, that's all being redrawn into the plan. So we'll have a skilled nursing facility also with 40 beds and an assisted living facility as well and a uh, full-time pharmacy. And so that's... What's the time frame, Joe? What, what's the time frame that you're looking at for that? Do you, I'm sorry? What's the new time frame for this to be? Well, that's a good question. See, uh, that, uh, under the, his, the developer's latest uh, statement to us at the uh, County Poly 2020 Community Planning Group, he said that he expects that the, uh, the revised plans should be done sometime uh, the middle of this year, uh, coming 2022, and uh, under construction to as revised later in the 2022 to be open sometime late in 2023. Okay. And uh, we'll we'll see that. Oh, we, I mean, we got the certificate need in 2009. Yeah, <laughs> it's been it's been a long time. That's just and and it doesn't expire, right? There's no. Is there a timeline? No, yeah. You know, there's there's volumes of information about this whole certificate of need. You know, anybody who's ever looked at, and I'm sure I know you have, yes, <laughs> in Hawaii's legislation and acts and things like this. Yeah, we've got so many volumes of pages of information. The state of Hawaii Health Planning and Development Agency, affectionately referred to as SHPTA, is uh, charged with this process of the certificate of need process, and there's just all kinds of um, volumes of information about regulations and things and protocols and uh, about that. That's what uh, or the study said. You know, no no other state has a more complicated regulatory hurdles for new health care facilities than any, no one besides Hawaii's. 28 separate services are subject to yeah. these state limitations. I'm working on one now with trying to assist one with one with for a West Maui Cancer Center. Uh, we've had a couple hearings. Uh, four years ago, they started. They wanted to build a cancer center in West Maui. They bought a lot, spent a million dollars, and a lot of research, and have ready to commit five, six million dollars more to do that. But they had to go through the certificate of need process, and they've had a couple hearings, unfavorable because the existing cancer center, who's got a monopoly, doesn't want any competition, yeah. and is trying to find any way at all to, to poke holes in uh, allowing this to happen, and uh, so. They've temporarily withdrawn their application to satisfy all the stated concerns that have been brought up at hearings to to restart again. And I'm, uh, I'll be announcing what those new plans are as soon as they tell me what the new plans are. They were they were going to have their third hearing today. Uh, they've had two prior ones, which was not favorable for them uh, in the committees. The state director of uh, the SHIPTA organization is the one who is charged with the responsibility of making the decision. No matter what these committees recommend to him, right. he can make his own decision uh, uh, whether to grant a certificate of need or not grant a certificate of need. Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna resub- they're gonna address the concerns and then resubmit. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they they are committed. They've got a they they did a certificate of need in Kauai. They have a Kauai Oncology Center that's been operating since 2012 very successfully. But uh, there, uh, there was no other. No one else wanted to, I guess, have a radiation center in Hawaii. They had to. Uh, they were the only ones who wanted to do it. And then, since they didn't have any competition, no one complained about them. So they, they were able to get that relatively easy over there. Hmm. Uh, but here, wherever there is a, a competitor or someone enjoying a monopoly, they don't want anybody else to come in. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's an issue. The game. Well, what about the community's needs? Yeah, you know that, that that's our whole thing. It's like we are just too far away. Right. Access is important. Quality of life is um, just the time it takes to get to someplace. Right. There's nothing more painful than to have a diagnosis of someone looking at you and, and saying, "Well, I got some bad news for you. You know, you got this cancer, and maybe you've got a month to live or not." Yeah. And how many people have heard those words? I, you know, your whole life changes. When you're someplace like here in West Maui or uh, some isolated place, and all of a sudden an emergency situation happens, uh, the baby can stops breathing somehow, starts coughing, or 
any number of different things, and, and you uh, the realization of, of how incredible uh, the magnitude of the problem is becomes very, very clear and realistic when yeah. you experience it. But right. uh, when yeah. you just hear about it, it doesn't. It's not the same. No. You it, once you experience it, then forever you're forever changed. Yeah. You'll, you'll never be the same, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I do. I really do. Yeah, and and I was gonna say I I, I went up to Cool Hospital one time and and um, it, you know I had an urgent situ- situation, not an uh, emergency, but they didn't have the scanning equipment. So after being there for a period of time and getting worked up and doing things, they had to transfer me to the Maui Memorial. Uh, so you're you're right. It, it, it they we have to look at the whole structure and we have to get beyond the competition answer as just the the overarching answer beyond what the community needs are. It's really important that we look at this, and now seems to be the perfect time to revisit it, and Tina Wildberger was on earlier as well, and one of the big uh, economic development initiatives that people are looking at is health and wellness and medical tourism, and to do that, that too will require revisiting the certificate of need process in a big way. So. I uh, really appreciate you sharing that with us. We've only got a couple minutes because we uh, I know we were going to talk about a couple of issues, but we're going to have to kind of cut this one short and, and uh, finish up with this. But let's talk really quickly about the West Maui Community Plan, which okay. is guiding the future development. And, you know, some of the concern uh, about, you know, the, the process – and want to talk about you know what you see as the key issues and goals that were identified in the plan, and what you feel really needs to rise up to the level of being included in the plan. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I was on the West Maui Community Plan Advisory Committee, and we met for many months going over this. So I, I know more than I, uh, than many about maybe the subject. Uh, West Maui Taxpayers Association conducted a survey to be used as a tool for consideration by the Maui County Council, who's currently reviewing the West Maui Community Plan draft. There seems to be major conflicting elements in the current draft with the Maui Island Plan as to areas where housing could be located and as such deserves to be more fully explored and carefully reviewed. Inconsistencies with the Maui Island Plan and the Kanapali 2020 community planning effort are potentially subject to unnecessary and unwanted litigation at the expense of Maui taxpayers. For example, the West Maui Community Plan draft currently proposes changes in land use designations for approximately 100 acres of the Kanapali South area for parks and open space instead, and 100 acres for agriculture where the Kanapali 2020 Community Plan and Island Plan envisions residential and mixed-use development. As an initial founding member of the Kanapali 2020 Community Planning effort, Two, I participated in monthly meetings for over 20 years with the team. This was an award-winning plan, and key stakeholders in the West Maui Community Plan who participated with me were Ed Lindsay, May Fujiwara, Buck Buchanan, Star Maderos, Eve Clute, A. James Riston III. Well, they're all now deceased and left this world thinking that Kanapali 2020 plan as incorporated into the Maui Island plan was going to be respected. But this draft disrespects the legis- legacies of these community members who were devoted to serving the West Maui community, and that's uh, simply not acceptable. Forty-eight percent of the s- respondents of our survey s- indicated they had never even heard of the West Maui Community Plan. The West Maui Community Plan draft eliminates hundreds of acres of housing in areas at Lani Apoko and Olawalu, where approximately half the survey participants indicated they would like to live. That's also not acceptable. So this survey was developed by the West Maui stakeholders and the West Maui board and facilitated in synergy with your wonderful Maui Chamber of Commerce and survey platforms and easily accessible via the internet. It can be viewed with its results on our West Maui taxpayers website at www.westmaui.org. Yeah, this, uh, so this there, is there, really important. How did the community meeting go the other night? The, com- the community meet. We had a the Zoom meeting we had with the council. Uh, there was a lot of testimony of people. Uh, uh, the councils receive all kinds of input. Uh, you know, there's what what what, what was evident to me at uh, the last several hearings that I've gone to, uh, where there's been community participation, is that there is a very loud vocal minority 
uh, that have a very strong emotional opinions that seem to intimidate and uh, have you heard the word bullying before I guess uh, it seems to intimidate or bully the other people I, I, I think the the Maui planning department was bullied <laughs> by mm-hmm. some of these things it's intimidated and the 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 plan that they submitted to us uh, as their recommendation for the West Maui community plan with changes was changed some rather dr- dramatically at the, the vocal minority bullying uh, concerns. It was, we did not have um, the kind of participation uh, in that draft review plan that I would have liked. It was broad and representative of the community. It was uh, unfortunate. And so yeah. the, 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 the Maui Island plan in the general plan uh, in the Kauna Poly 2020 community plan, all these things to spent many, many years and many long hours. And and for that all that to be ignored now and just with a stroke of the brush, taking away land that could be used for affordable housing is not, our opinion, the way you help affordable housing that can get built. We have a crisis upon a crisis upon a crisis. And instead of making things better, there this change that is currently considered by the county council and uh, is is actually making it worse they're yeah. increasing Joe, I'm gonna uh, have to I'm gonna have to stop you there because we've we've got to uh, continue on with the show um, okay. but tell people quickly how they can get involved well you know we're here to advocate for them so we need uh, just like we, we didn't want their support they can help us in volunteering uh, on committees, working together with us on projects, or sending us donations. Okay, and so all that is all evident on the West Maui website, uh, westmaui.org, or they can call us anytime at six six one seven nine nine zero. And uh, awesome. we're anxious to help them. Great. All right, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing, and we'll encourage everybody to go to westmaui.org or contact the West Maui Taxpayers Association. Thank you, Pamela. God bless. God bless you, too. Have a wonderful day. All right, so I did want to share that this Saturday is the rescheduled 8th Annual Hawaiian Airlines Made in Maui County Festival. Um, we There was a glitch on our virtual event on November 6th, so we are doing it. But now we are doing it again, uh, both virtual and live. We've worked with uh, Mayor Victorino and the Parks Department, and we're going to be able to do a live event at the old soccer field uh, outside of War Memorial Gym, and the uh, live event will be open at 9 a.m. this Saturday, December 4th to 4.30, where you can shop live with vendors. Our other vendors, uh, there will be some who will be, all of the booths will be virtual online there as well. So if you're unable to come out that day or just prefer to shop from home, you can find all of the booths. But some of the vendors who want to participate in the live event will have their booth up on the virtual platform as well as they'll be live. So we want to encourage you to come down. If you were trying to enter into any of the contests, all of that has been extended. So there's still many great prizes that you can win. Come down and visit us live, or you can go to madeinmauicountyfestival.com to learn more about what's coming up this Saturday on December 4th. So we're very happy to share that with you and, again, to work with all of our vendors who put so much effort into the November 6th event to give them an opportunity for, you know, so many of the community were reaching out, understood what they were going for and going through and excited to purchase from the vendors. So now we'll have that chance, and we're really thrilled to do it, both live and a virtual event, and just deeply appreciate all the work that the administration did to help us with that. And one of those vendors is uh, Libby Ben, who is the owner of Maui Island Love. Libby and her family have been living on Maui for over 30 years, and she has been handcrafting. She loves the love and feel of the islands, and she wants to bring that to people that they can carry with them forever. Maui Island Love uh, partners with local communities to uh, and companies to obtain materials they use to make their phenomenal products which I'm going to have her share with you. So good morning and aloha, Libby. Aloha, Pam. Great to have you on the show this morning. Thanks so much for the invite. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? 
We are good. Oh, it's it, it's a gorgeous day today, so I'm so glad to it see is. it. We're praying for Saturday. I know. <laughs> but rain or shine, folks, we're going to be there. Rain or shine. Our first year <laughs> with the Made of Mine County Festival, it rained. It poured, in fact. And everybody came out with their umbrellas and had a great time. Right. We've been with you since the beginning, and I think we've had um, every weather pattern imaginable, and it's always <laughs> been fantastic. <laughs> it is, because people just cherish this great opportunity to meet with people like you and so many others. Uh, you know, tell everybody, again, you've got such a story about how you got started and the inspiration behind your business. Share that with our audience. Sure. So we we began our business about eight years ago, and how it came to be is I've always done crafting, and I've always made gifts for friends and family at Christmas, and one year I just kind of looked around the house, and I said, I'm not going to purchase anything. I'm going to use things that I already have on hand, and I, I made some tote bags out of um, scrap materials that I, I had, and it was a huge hit, and one of our friends that we gave a tote to actually asked us to make more so they could have it at their salon. Ah. From there, um, one of their clients saw our tote and started carrying it in their store, in their retail store, and we were officially in business. <laughs> and we've been able ever since to continue making all of our products out of repurposed, reused, recycled materials. And, you know, combining our, our passion of crafting and recycling into, into a business. Well, you have and, phenomenal purses. They're stunning. Oh, thank you. You know, the, the, the basis of many of our totes are actually made from 12-ounce drop cloths. My husband, Rich, was in the paint industry for 25 years. And it was a, it was a perfect <laughs> fit for us. So we buy ginormous 12-ounce um, drop cloths. We um, cut them up into manageable pieces. He splatter paints them, and then we make them into our sacks of aloha, which have our own original designs on the pocket. Um, our other products are small totes. We partner with some local furniture stores, and we're able to obtain some discontinued fabric pieces. As well, we scour, you know, thrift stores and yard sales and whatever we can get our hands on because there's tons of recycled materials out there. We use linens and clothing and whatever we can, we'll cut it up and turn it into a product. And everyone is unique. Exactly. It makes, and that's the one thing that, you know, it, it they are each unique and you won't find it mass, the same design mass produced. So people really get to connect with the item and choose which one speaks to them. Yeah, there and and I love that you have now different sizes. So you've got everything from adorable clutches to purses to totes. And, and you've also come up with a new product that I love. You, tell us about your new uh, wooden ornaments. Right. So the ornament lines, we partnered with another local company um, who does laser cutting, and we designed our own line, drew them out. And so we're doing wooden ornaments out of, you know, um, the shape of Honus, Maui Island, ukulele, humpbacks, and what's been most popular are our hula girl ornaments. And they come in a, in a green or natural grass skirt. So the hula girls are cut, and then we dress them up. We have recycled yarns. We're making, you know, the haku headlay, um, and then the grass skirt, and we embellish the rim. And on the feet, it says the word Maui. And they're really, they're darling, and they've been really well received. They really are adorable, absolutely adorable. Uh, take, I, I'm going to have Libby tell you where you can find these as well. But um, do you have any specials that are coming up this holiday season? You know, we... Um, we just are always putting fresh new products out there, and so we encourage people to look because pretty much as soon as we post things, they are often right out the door again. Yes. Um, so always fresh new items that are coming coming out, um, and and again the whole ornament line is new, and we are always making new products and getting them out there. You really are a pro prolific manufacturer. You've got so many ideas, and I think that probably comes <laughs> from the years of crafting. So many things going on. Um, but I, I was surprised to see the, the wooden ornaments, and, and yet they're adorable. 
Oh, thank you. Yes, we look forward to the day when uh, we get to just do the business because we still work full time and we do that. So that's okay. Yeah. Uh, eventually we'll be able to uh, make that shift and we look forward to that. Oh, I, you know, that's the thing. And it's one of the things that excites us so much about the Made in Maya County Festival is that if we can help make the right connections with, with increasing the order size and the wholesale buyers and distributors, so many of our folks now have gone from doing the part-time business, like you working full-time and doing it on evenings and weekends, to it's their full-time business now, and, and they're living exactly. their dream. And yeah. we appreciate that because it's certainly that Made in Maui County Festival has been a, a huge boost in our business, and we've made some wonderful connections through that. Oh, that, we love hearing that. And, of course, we're hoping again this Saturday, December 4th, folks, we want, we want to continue. And now you can find, you know where to get a hold of Libby. But, Libby, tell everybody where they can find your products. Definitely. So, you know, this Saturday, unfortunately, we're not able to participate in person, but we'll be available virtually on our website at MauiIslandLove.com. We're always uh, posting new items on our Facebook page at Maui Island Love or Instagram at Maui Island Love. And our products are also located at Weekends at the Hyatt, the Maui Ocean Center, Mana Foods, Kula Marketplace, Totally Hawaiian Gift Gallery. Local folks, we're always happy to have you up at the house or we could meet somewhere so you can look through some inventory and choose any items that um, are of interest to you. And you, I know you work with people as well, that if they have a particular color that they're interested in, you oh, can exactly, assist them. Oh, exactly, yes a theme or a color. Um, we have clients that have small groups that are coming over and we make, you know, totes for their groups because they want people to have something unique and individual and not just mass produced. So we always welcome that opportunity. That is so cool. And, and so everybody can, they can find you at MauiIslandLove.com. There you go. Awesome. Oh, Libby, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, We look forward and hope that there's a lot of great shopping for your amazing products online this Saturday. Again, not everybody's going to be live, but the festival booths are going to be up, and we encourage you to shop with those local vendors and participate because there's going to be so many cherished gifts, and it's right in time for the holiday season. So take advantage and look for the new ornaments. Uh, Yes. Thank you for joining us, Libby. And Thank you so much, Pam. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you as well. It always goes quick here at Business Matters. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We appreciate our sponsor, Mokulele Airlines. I'm Pamela Tumpot, President of the Maui Chamber of Commerce, wishing you blessings and best wishes for a beautiful Maui day. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday.